Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this YouTube live session. Uh, I'm, my name is Rajas Kadana, I'm with Pratik Khen, um, who's an EGMAP student, and I'm um, a 764. In this YouTube live session, we're going to talk about uh, uh, Pratik's journey, how he went from um, 650 to a, to a 760. So welcome, Pratik. Thank you so much, Rajas. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, and, and, and thank you for that introduction. The people that are only okay. YouTube, the people why? That are in your group. Sometimes YouTube ads mess up. So, um, <laughs> so Pradeep, before we start with your journey, let's kind of um, uh, talk a bit about yourself. Um, give us your background. What is it that you do? And um, and and I mean, what's your job day in and day out? Sure. Um, so so I was born in India, but I moved to Canada for my undergrad. And then subsequently moved to Toronto for my master's in global affairs at U of T, which is public policy. And so that's what my background really is. It's in it's in public policy. Mm -hmm. I've worked for the government of Ontario for a couple of years, uh, first as an economist and as a policy advisor. And now I work uh, for the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, uh, which is one of the five big banks of, of Canada. And again, my area of work is around analyzing financial regulations, um, you know, understanding how they impact the business, and then uh, advising senior management on what our next steps are. So it's a very hard qualitative background. Um, and mm -hmm. and yes, that's, that's the background that I come from. But I would say that econ and mathematics were a big part of, of my life because I was an honor student in economics. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely do have a I do have good foundations in quant, but if we're talking about a competitive advantage, I would say it's verbal for sure. Got it. So stronger in verbal, good in quant is how you would describe yourself. Yes. Okay. All right. So so um, before we kind of go into your GMAT journey, um, let's kind of talk about uh, you've already applied to B schools. And uh, and so why the MBA? Right. And, and that's a that's a great question. I think this is a question that's going to come up. Uh, so I'm very glad that I'm getting the chance to, you know, brainstorm mm -hmm. this with you. Um, I think now and, 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 and this is a trend post 2008 2009 financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, you will notice and that you can obviously speak to it better. I think if you want to, I lost my house in that crisis. So I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> <about that. laughs> um, but the general turn that the economy took, I think it expected global leaders or, or leaders in any industry to be um, truly diverse. And by diverse, I mean, have an understanding of how both the government works and how the private sector works, because in a sense, these two industries became intertwined. Um, as policymakers, when I was working for the government, I would often struggle with understanding how the private sector works, because a lot of policies that I was making were for them. Now, when I work in the business side of things. So when I work um, in the financial industry, I only have one picture of the coin, which is mm. how are those regulations impacting us? But the other side of the industry, I'm not very well aware of, which is how do businesses pursue organizational change? How do they grow? How do they you know, drive efficiency? How do they innovate in an uncertain economic environment? Um, so because I have a policy background, I want to complement that with strong foundations in business um, mm -hmm. because, and again, the first, I would say the, the first big shakeup was the financial crisis. And I think the second big shakeup is the COVID pandemic uh, because it's really driven the symbiotic relationship between Absolutely. the public and private sector. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, so first of all, it seems like the, you know, the MBA is the next logical thing for you, given mm -hmm. what you've done for that many years. One of the interesting things with what you've been talking about is if you look at um, the demand for MBAs during, and, and I don't know, should I call this after the pandemic or let's call it towards the fag end of the pandemic, right now we're getting vaccinated. The demand for MBAs has gone up because um, one of the things that MBAs do really well is, is navigate through an uncertain environment and or a changing environment, even if you don't call it uncertain, the stock market's pretty good. But it's a changing environment. We're changing how we work. We're changing how we collaborate. We're changing, you know, what what innovation means in many ways. And and right. and, and so um, so so and that's why the demand for MBAs has been um, 
higher than ever. The salaries, the starting salaries have been higher than ever. So, um, so I think that's, uh, that's a fair point as to why people who are doing really well in their careers should think about, about their MBAs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you thought about your MBA, you, you thought about it last year as well. That's why you did the GRE. You had over a 324, you said. I did 324, yes. 324. And um, and then you said, okay, I've got to get into LBS and looking at Chicago and um, uh, Booth and, and Harvard. And you, you decided to take the GMAT. So mm -hmm. um, what was your starting score when you, when you started preparing for the GMAT? And when was that? So I took the first official mock test in... May. Hmm. May of this year. May of this year. May of this year. Yeah. Um, and my official score was 650. Now I think the breakdown was 34, 35 on verbal. I mm -hmm. think it was I think it was 35, but I could be wrong. And then on quant, I think it was 44 or 45. Yeah, um, so I have a, a Q44 V35. I kind of took some notes from that's uh, the one. That's the one. From, yeah. from your from your interview. Uh, for those of you who actually, uh, Pradeep has also done an interview on on the EGMAT platform. Mm -hmm. You guys can watch that as well. Um, also during this um, uh, session, you know, putting for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up for your questions. So we'll be sharing a bunch of links uh, that you can use to complement the information that we provide in the session. And then if you have questions. Uh, 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 then, then, uh, then, definitely put them uh, in the poll, and we'll take those questions towards the end. So let's look at this. You had a 650, uh, you know, a Q44 V35. Um, what did that tell you, and how did you use that information to plan your preparation? I was very surprised with my verbal score. Uh, I'll be honest with you, because I thought that just because I can speak English in a certain way, just because I have a command over the language. Uh, verbal should not be an issue. And I'd heard this from a lot of people that the GMAT verbal is very tricky in that, you know, breaking the V40 barrier is really something that puts people in the 95th, 96th percentile, given that a lot of folks are able to hit the 48, 49 on quant. Um, so when the 30, when I saw the 35 and then specifically when I saw sentence correction, I, I suddenly realized, all right, this is a big gap because I had gotten most of my sentence corrections wrong. Um, and that was that was the first wake up call for me. I said, all right, something has to give here because I cannot I cannot be doing verbal and relying solely on critical reasoning and reading comprehension. Mind you, I did get a lot of CR and RC wrong as well. But in comparison, my SC was way off. So in terms of preparation and, and quant, I knew I'd lost some of those, you know, some of those foundations because it had been a very long time since I'd done questions like these, but they weren't alien to me. So I knew they would come back fairly quickly. But in terms of strategizing, I wanted, I really wanted to sit down and have a structure in front of me that would take me through the sentence correction and that themselves understood the sentence correction um, on the GMAT. I needed a structure that knew exactly what sentence correction was about, mm -hmm. how to tackle it, and how to get past that V4142. So so, so just the takeaway from, from that initial uh, mock was SC is a big problem. You tackle SC, the, you'd be able to break the V40 barrier. And again, you scored V47, which is better than 99 percentile. So, so you did improve a lot in CR and RC as well, but yeah. the SC was the one big thing. The other thing was you said, OK, I have some gaps in quant, but I'm not going to worry a whole lot about them because I I know I'm rusty in a few areas or so. Right. Yeah. So then post that, did you create a study plan? How did you go about doing that? No, then I started asking people about, you know, what what was some of the courses that they had done? And nine, so, well, I I only asked seven people. Six out of seven people told me that they took the EG map. So I didn't create a study plan. I just put my numbers into your, I, you, guys, you guys have a uh, 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 a tool that shoots a study plan at you. So I put my numbers in there. I told uh, the EGMAT uh, infrastructure that this is when I wanted to take the test. Mm -hmm. And um, then EGMAT threw back a study plan at me. And that's that's what I relied on. I definitely tweaked how much. Yeah, so how did you tweak it? You, you got I, that initial plan from the PSP. So I, I focused 70% uh, of my time on verbal and 30% of my time on quant. Because moving into verbal, the moment I looked at the modules and sentence correction, I said, all right, this is exactly what I need. I need 
a pause that tells me what sentence correction is. And then the other big take for me was when I finished a part of SC, because that was the first thing that that was a part of my plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I took the cementing quizzes, I realized, all right, this is very important for me because I've seen a significant improvement, mm -hmm. but I'm one of those people who, who wants to um, drive. Perfect. Yeah. And it, it can be a little bit of a problem, but it was, it was definitely something that I kept hammering on. Okay. So let's start with, 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 with SC, uh, um, right now. So you, someone just to add some context, you've been living in Canada for quite some time. Eight years. Uh, uh, and you were, was it, would it be fair to say you're a convent educated, you know, back from India? Public school educated. Yes. yes. Public school educated, or right. what we in the U S call as private school educated. Right. 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 So, so, um, so fairly good background and, and, and yet you didn't do well on, on sentence correction. So when you started with the GMAT SC course, how did it change how your, your perception of what sentence correction is all about? And, and what is, what were the key takeaways when, when you were doing the course right. that, that helped you benefit or hundred percent. So the, the first thing that, that really stood out for the EGMAT sentence correction was focus on the meaning first and we'd figure out the grammar in a bit. And the way I was going about it was completely the other way around. Um, I was focusing predominantly on the grammar and not looking too much at the meaning as such. Okay. Um, and, and the way EG Matt approaches sentence correction is that it breaks down sentences into chunks. It breaks it down into the context of the sentence, into the meaning of the sentence and whether or not those two align with each other. And once, the sentence makes sense from a meaning perspective, then we start looking at the various grammars, uh, grammatical, you know, uh, objects, whether they fit in, whether the modifiers are correct, whether it's parallel, whether the verbs are in order and so on and so forth. Now, if you don't have the meaning correct in the first place, then it's like hammering your head against the wall. It's not going to really take you too far. And that's what I was doing. And that might work for a 600 to 700 question you know, where you instinctively know the right answer, depending on, depending on how strong your verbal is to begin with, mm -hmm. uh, instinctively a medium question, you may or may not be able to get right because, you know, you said, oh, I've heard this so many times, I've read it so many times, it seems correct, but it's really when you hit those 700 kind of questions that you start understanding that you cannot go on an ad hoc basis here. You need to first understand the meaning then you need to put the grammar in use. Then you need to see whether all of them align. And I think that's what, um, that's what EG math sentence correction does. And it also breaks down sentence correction into chunks. So you have verb ED, then you have modifiers, then you have parallelism. Now those in themselves are huge lessons. Um, and Rajat, I know you have my statistics. So you'll see, I spent a lot of time on modifiers and I spent a lot of time on verb ING. Things that going into the GMAT, I thought I was already good at. You know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think that I would need to study so much for modifiers. But yes. So, so I think um, this is something which is which is which is um, very very interesting. Again, uh, the, the the context being that you talk about the six hundred and seven hundred. Let me just translate that and what you said into essentially how people experience. So when it comes to the 600 level questions, what really happens is you've got to express the correct meaning, but the other options that are there um, would be in a form that are not what I call as readily accepted constructs. So if right. you know the, the readily accepted construct, you can actually select the correct one, even when you don't focus as much on the meaning. Right. When you get to 700 level questions, what happens is you'll have three or four options that would be in, in the form of good constructs which right. means that grammar would not be the way that you'd be able to eliminate those unless and until you, you understand the meaning that you need to communicate and you know, okay, you know, how does a comma verb ing work versus a verb ing without a comma works? How, how do we compare like entities versus actions? And, 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 and if you can't make that judgment from the meaning as to what the intention is, you, you choose a construct which sounds right, but which doesn't express the logical meaning or the intended meaning. And, um, and that's kind of where you struggle with 700 level questions if you don't focus on the meaning. Just to put this in context, specifically for me, before I started studying through the EG rat, I think I was getting about seven or eight out of 10 wrong mm -hmm. um, on those 700 kind of questions. And that was a big problem for me uh, because 
I knew that if I worked very, very, very hard, I would probably hit a 49.50 on quant. I, I, I knew that I would have to work significantly harder to get from a 49 to a 50 on my quant. Hmm. But I knew that, you know, I had some foundations in verbal and therefore I should be able to hit a 41, 42. But when I started seeing those statistics for myself on sentence correction, um, I said, all right, there has to be a more objective way of going about getting these right. There has to be a more, and, and I remember my friend who had taken this and, and even my cousin who had taken the EGMAT, they said, the best thing that EGMAT does is it takes out the subjectivity out of verbal. It treats it like a science. There's almost strict formulae uh, on how you approach a sentence correction. And in the moment when they said that to me, I, I couldn't really make sense of what that means. Um, but when I started going through each of those modules, that's when it, that's when I said, all right, this is this, you know, it, it almost lifted sort of an, a cloud of haziness almost. Um, and, and that was super that's good to know. I, and a pile was here sometime back. She'll be really happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So let's kind of talk about, since you talked about the modules or rather, we call them learning activities internally. Yeah. So each, yeah. and you talked about stats as well. So each activity within the EGMAT platform is scored. We give you um, a grading on how well you've spent the last 30 to 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. How did you leverage those scores to, to, to not just achieve a V40, but a V47 or so, or, or better than 99 percentile? Right. Um, so we start with a pre-assessment uh, quiz. Mm -hmm. That's where you really know where you stand. Um, then you go through the, the modules of the learning activities, and then mm -hmm. you to the post assessment. So for me, the biggest indicator of growth was going from that pre assessment to post assessment, seeing how well I've done on that particular learning activity, right. And then I would take those learnings and then I would go to OG. And then I would do a bunch of questions there, then I would come back to cementing quizzes, because cementing quizzes are significantly harder than uh, OG. And, and I remember the first cementing quiz I took for sentence correction, I got 70% or something like that. That was a medium cementing quiz, yes. I on a medium that. cementing quiz, yes. right. And and that threw me off. I said, well, this, what's happening here? Because, you know, I, I think that I have a very good understanding. Um, and then suddenly I saw that EGMAT, you know, it, it gives you a rating. It says, all the right. threshold, good. basically. Yeah, they, they said this is good. I said, okay, this is great, but I want to make sure that I go back to this module and don't make the verb ing error again. So if you actually look at my statistics, you'll see that I spent a lot of time on verb ing. I, yeah, you, you, you access those files four to five times as we were talking about it. I access those files four to five times. And, and I think how that translated to a V47 on the GMAT was because I was so used to tougher questions and I was so used to drilling so hard on concepts that might seem basic, but are essential to breaking that V42, 44, 45 barrier, that when those GMAT questions came about, um, it, it became significantly, I wouldn't say easier, but it became significantly more manageable to break that 45. Because I'd already done pre-assessment, I'd already done OG, and I'd done the hard cementing quizzes. So there was nothing that I hadn't seen. There was no concept that EG Matt had not already covered that was going to be tested. Um, okay. And I think that familiarity was, yeah. So, so one of the things I was also looking at, I was looking at your trend plot in, in the cementing portion in Scholaranium. And mm -hmm. um, I think it was the second or the third medium cementing quiz where you got 100%. I don't know if you remember that instance. Um, and and then one of the hard cementing quizzes, you even got a, an 80 or a 90%, which I think, right. they, and it was among the second or third ones as well. Right. So, right. Um, so, so that was, for me, that was incredible overall that, that, that you, because 80% in a hard cementing quiz was 99 percentile student for us. And, uh, and, and for me, that was, the, that, that was, the, and that must have been the, you know, that the satiation point where I said, all right, now I know this, now I know the fundamentals well enough. Let me move to the next thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. Someday I'll put the math of how that 80% in, in hard cementing translates to that 99 percent it's, it's, it's sure. fairly simple probabilistic math uh coming back to this so you were good in crnrc so we, we covered sc right you were good in crnrc um 
but but you still had some gaps you were not 99 percent talent cr and rc no god no god no i uh, in in cr i was i, I was i was okay at cr because i uh, i've been a debater all my life so hmm. i i i'd like to think that that i can critically analyze things but again it sitting down and doing it purposely is a whole different ball game. And, and I was speaking about this with somebody the other day that for critical reasoning, the first thing that you need to keep in mind is that everything that you need to know about the topic in question is given you, given to you in that small essay, you are not to use outside knowledge to make sense of how the critical reasoning question works. And all of that forms a part of plea thinking, even before you start looking at the answers. You have to develop a sense of how this question is flowing, where, where it's trying to go to, and what are the different strategies you can use, um, whether it's a negation strategy or any other strategy. Um, how do you tackle this question? So whereas I was decent at critical reasoning, I definitely did spend a lot of time on, again, you have my stats, um, on the cementing quizzes. Yes. Um, and. For reading comprehension, I think this was very important because there are certain kinds of reading comprehensions that I'm just not good at or wasn't good at. Uh, Science-based would be one because that's not the You're kind of- You're an econ background person, student. So I'm an econ background person. And uh, so my humanities-based reading comprehensions are fairly strong. But if you throw a geology RC at me or if you throw um, you know, a physics RC at me, that's going to throw me off. And the way I tackled that was um, I went about reading eclectic stuff from all over the place um, on The Economist. So I would do three to four articles a day, um, specifically science-based. Then I would come back to EGMAT. I would take cementing quizzes. Then I would even read sometimes, you know, what are some of the pre-thinking skills here? Because pre-thinking happens to be uniform across the module. It's, yes. it's used in CRR, CSC. So I said, all right, what, how, how is the pre-thinking working here? And again, my cementing quizzes were not, I don't think they were great in RC because, uh, they were meaning, above the threshold level. Yeah, they, they were above the threshold. Um, but again, when I started doing the RCs at, at EG map, then the other RCs became significantly easier because then I would go to OG and I would say, okay, this is. So, so then when you did the RCs or this or, or CR questions and you looked at how the passage was analyzed, the passive paragraph summaries and the solutions. So did that kind of help organize your thoughts? hundred percent, because you're then focusing more on the structure of the reading comprehension or the critical reasoning and then um, on the subject matter, because and I think EG maths understand this and understands this better and you know, saves us a lot of time in that GMAT doesn't expect you to be a subject matter expert. Uh, they expect you to be able to think in a structured manner. And once you're able to hack what that structured manner is, then it becomes particularly, it becomes, it becomes easier to, to manage a big reading comprehension in a subject that you may or may not be comfortable with. Um, and I think that's the whole pre-thinking. So, so your challenge really was the fact that, Hey, right now in your current job, you are supposed to read information critically but you're also supposed to apply the knowledge that you possess to yeah. interpret it 100%. which in in the context of gmat rc you're not supposed to apply the knowledge that you possess you're just supposed to read critically the information exists don't bring in outside information yeah. unless and until it's absolutely common knowledge the fact that covid is, is, is you know is is is, 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 uh, is a kind of virus Right, 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 right. You don't need that to know the of, biology of it all. Yeah. yeah, you don't need to worry about the biology of it all because anything that you need needs to be there. So that critical eye, you still need that, but the context that you possess, you should don't really, you shouldn't really worry about it as much because in fact, if you worry about it, you end up answering questions incorrectly sometimes. And I think that was the biggest takeaway. Um, I was, I was trying to focus too much on the context. Uh, sorry, too much on my outside knowledge. And I think I made some mistakes in economics based ones more so than in science based ones because in science i didn't really have that outside knowledge to begin with but in economics i did so I, but for me the key really is if you are that 99 percentile scholar one of the key things other than being diligent other than having that plan is is having that awareness as to what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and right. in your case you kind of knew your strengths were cr and rc but right. even within that context you knew okay science passages problem Geology passages problems have got to do shore up 
those areas and that's where you went to the economist you read those articles right. and, and and talking about reading those articles i think um you uh, in your review and and I think you can share that review um you also had a very specific study schedule i mean you'd study at certain times during right. the day you right. talk about how you developed that schedule what was the reasoning behind that right i honestly i didn't really have much time other than 9 to 11:30 at night to study because my work starts at anywhere between 8 and 8:30 and then it it goes on to 6 6:30 in the evening mm-hmm. um uh, but the other thing is also um you know after working out after having my dinner that's when i'm most calm after a heavy day of work and those are the good 2 to 1 and a half hours that i can give to my uh to my to my study or, or now that i'm not studying to reading and stuff so um i knew that i couldn't go you know in a schedule where i hadn't studied for 5 days and suddenly think that everything was going to be all rosy by studying for 3 4 hours on the weekend so i needed to consistently keep up with my skills that i was picking up on gmat mm-hmm. uh, on on egmat sorry um so i developed a plan where i said all right we wake up at 6 we'll do our thing work till 6 pm in the evening and then give myself 2 hours of good solid studying um and focus on things that i've done in the past to one make sure so the first half an hour of my study would be to go over what i'd done the previous day if i was strong in what i'd already done the previous day then i would move to the next module so i think the biggest thing is if i didn't have a structured if i didn't have eg mat telling me this is what needs to be done next i would have been all over the place but that's uh, i think way way but what you said right now is very valuable yes we told you but not many people do the fact that you say i'm going to revise the first 30 minutes what i did yesterday i'm going to that's mm-hmm. another way of cementing and that's yes. you know a very valuable habit that anyone who's listening to this can can actually take on and say hey this is something that we've got to do mm-hmm. 100% so i and 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 i don't and i don't mean to say that you know give up everything and just study for the gmat 24/7 that's not you'll burn out at some point so you need to you need to pace yourself but and the best way to do that is keep going through things that you've done in the past because there's a lot of content that you're covering and and if you're not in touch with what you've mastered already then there's a there's a chance that what you're good at will not be your strongest point on the gmat and you don't want that you want to be able to hammer hard on your strengths that's true uh, and so even when i was doing quant rajat i remember i was doing very difficult word problems uh, from eg mat i would reserve the last half an hour for sentence correction questions wow even during quant even uh, during that's that's valuable i i would do an hour and a half of word problems uh, and then i would say all right let's end the night by doing about 15 sentence correction questions um either through eg mat or through og in most cases it would be through eg mat because that was sort of the harder and i don't know if my statistics show this i think i ran out of my c questions uh at the some point the hard ones yeah because you still I, had medium and an easy ones left yes medium and easy ones left but i was i was really trying to get that you know yeah one thing that had you written to us you would what we would have told you you didn't take sigma x marks had you I taken didn't those Had yeah. you taken those mocks? Because each mock also has about two and a half times as many questions in the question bank. Right, right. So, right. so you would have gotten more questions in Scholaranium once you take mocks. I, I, yeah, I, I learned that. I learned that later on, and it was one of those things where, but like I said, I kept going back to my fundamentals on what where I wanted to drive growth. It was, it was in sent, and then it was in RC as well. So. Mm-hmm. half an hour of sentence correction so let's say for example i'm work, studying between 9 and 11 pm so 9 to 10:30 would be in quant during quant it would be 9 to 10:30 would be word problems say simple interest compound interest so on so forth work time mm-hmm. probabilities x x y z and then half an hour would be for sentence correction and I, then i'd wrap my night up by reading three articles from the economist in half an hour what that does is it it does two things for you when you're reading that much um one it increases your pace of reading right but increasing your pace of reading is like eating a lot of food and not enjoying it if you're just consuming a lot of food and you're not that's, enjoying that's it that's a great example i think i i, I will use that <laughs> so, also um if you yeah so if you're reading a lot of eating a lot of food and you're not enjoying it or you're not being able to understand what you're 
eating, you have the chances that you're probably going to get a bad stomach. But if you take your time, um, you know, and you build up that skill, that's when you're really driving value out of the nutrients. And that's how reading is. Um, in the GMAT, a lot of people struggle, in my opinion, with timing on reading comprehensions. Um, so I made it a point that I'd read a lot so that when I was coming across reading comprehensions, one, I was going through the information quickly, and two, I was actually being able to absorb and analyze that information. That's more important. You might as well take another couple of minutes, hmm. but once you've read that RC, you better have it nailed down because you don't have the time to look at the question, keep going back again and again. What um, you're saying is read, make sure that initial read is so such of such high quality that that you can answer questions quickly. Yeah, or, or in, a, in a different way, I'm going to really talk about some of the experiments you've done internally and, right. and how that plays out uh, with data. Now, uh, now before I go to Quant, we have about 10, uh, eight or nine minutes of interview left before we go sure. into Q&A. Um, one of the other things I liked about your preparation was you didn't kill yourself. You didn't give up your life. You still worked out. And, and that's very important. You've got to keep yourself fresh. And I think mm -hmm. everyone should, should do that. So let's kind of go from verbal to quant right now. So you knew your quant was strong, yet you had a Q44 in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Which were your focus areas and how did you go about uh, uh, using the EGMAT platform for those? Um, so word problem was definitely my focus area because it's the focus area of GMAT. Uh, that's where uh, you have to be strategic about how, uh, how you prepare for this exam, uh, because you might know a lot about a certain topic, but if that topic's not being tested, then, then unfortunately all of that knowledge is to waste. So I knew, um, word problems are a big part of the GMAT. So that's what I focused on the most, but prior to that, I wanted to build up my foundations in arithmetic and number properties, because um, in, in my previous interview, I spoke about this with DJ and I said, number properties is uh, number properties in arithmetic are interesting in that you can in the moment, again, depending on your math skills, you can in the moment sit down and derive formulae and, you know, be able to answer questions, but you don't have the time to do that. If you're spending more than two minutes on any question, then um, you're already going down the drain. So those arithmetics and number properties, that, those were my building blocks, foundational building blocks. And then I really, and you'd see this in my, again, in my statistics, I really went back and forth with word problems. If you see my simple interest, compound interest uh, module, for instance, or my work rate time was another one that I was really focusing hard on sales for funny enough, profit loss. Uh, profit and loss. Those were, those were my, those were my big areas of focus. And the reason was, that you know as far as the concepts are concerned the concepts are not that hard to wrap your head you're an down. economist they shouldn't be hard for you yeah and but when you start doing those questions you're asking yourself all right if you give me five minutes i'll be able to answer it but how do i break that you know 130 140 second 140 hmm. minute and how do i solve it before two minutes hmm. um and that's that's how i approached my quant i kept going back on word problems so 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 in the EGMAT course architecture, you have this very, our quant architecture is very different from the verbal architecture where, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have a single course, but you have upwards of a thousand courses based on your right. ability. Right. Given that you had, you didn't want to go through the entire course, you had those strengths, your weaknesses. How did you utilize that architecture to, to make sure you get the maximum out of the course? Right. And so the great thing, again, the great thing about the EGMAT is it push, it puts you through the pre-assessment, mm -hmm. um, then study and then post assessment. So anywhere yeah. where I was very comfortable with pre assessment, I would skip the first. Th and I think Pyle, when Pyle's videos come up, she says, all right, if you've done well enough in these, you can move ahead. If you want to, we suggest that you don't, but if you want to, you can move ahead. So I really took that to heart. Anywhere where so I- you actually I, utilize that feedback and so? Oh, 100%, 100%. 100%. I mean, it, I'd heard from too many people that EG Matt is good for me to not trust it. So I, I took that to heart. So in a lot of cases, I did skip the first four or five, wherever applicable, mm -hmm. but in cases where my pre-assessment was anywhere under 90%, um, I made sure to go through each one of those modules, even if they were basic. Um, even if I knew the formulae for simple interest and compound interest, I still went through the module. It can be painful to go through information that you already know, 
Yes. But there's a reason why it's there. Um, and and if you're not if you're not scoring that 95, 97, 98 percent, then you want then you want to take your time. Uh, at least that's how I approach it. Uh, that that's so good to know. I think um, for us this has been incredible with regards to this new learning architecture mm-hmm. um, in Quant, which we which we kind of introduced with Quant. We actually want to a enhance that and in, and and even put that in verbal as well because I think it allows you to be much more strategic with where you spend time and how much time you spend. So, okay. uh, but next month we'll be enhancing expert with. Um, what we call as a pace engine. Pace is personalized oh, adaptive. Engine? Pace means personalized adaptive course engine. So, okay. so, so, so essentially, those diagnostics would go to that next level. They actually will build that custom course right away, and you'd be able to really say, "This is the this is the full course. This is the recommended course for you." And you can go through either one, and 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 and, and so um, and it's done to be very flexible in in a manner so that it can be applied to the verbal part as well. So, so that right. personalization will carry through, not just in, in the, stu- the study plan level, but also internally throughout the course in the next two to three months. That makes, yeah. That, yeah, that's, that's going to be very helpful. Yeah. So, so let's kind of talk about this over here. So you also practice a lot of questions in Scholar Name, and Scholar Name questions are a bit more challenging than what you would They're very challenging. They're not, they're not fun. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. They can throw you off. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the moment, it seems painful, but it definitely pays off on the day. How does that pay off? I mean, you see, you see your, you see your skills improving as you do mock tests. And I only did official mock tests. So when I went from Scholaranium to official mock tests, um, the the difference was uh, was substantial in in the level of difficulty. And and I thought to myself, all right, if I can do so, then then my Opinions changed. I said, all right, if I can do scholaranium, then I should be able to hit the GMAT hard well enough. And midway into my eGMAT preparation, GMAT preparation through eGMAT, I started getting a feeling that, you know, it's very real that I'd be able to get a good verbal score. Um, maybe not a V47, but I was fairly confident that I was going to be able to hit a 42, 43. And everybody I had spoken to said, it's if you break a V41, 42, you're already above 720 or 730. Um, so when I started doing hard scholaranium questions, I remember it was very frustrating. I'm not going to lie, Roger, because I was not getting them right. And and I kept going back to them. And then just to make myself, myself feel a little bit better, I would go to OG. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I would get 100% and then I would come back again with a, with a higher confidence level. And so I remember I went from 650 and then the next mock I took was a month and a half or two months later. I think it was two months later. And uh, I went from a 650 to a 740 on the second official mock test. Wow. Um, so since we are on mocks, let's kind of be towards the end of the sessions, but right. two minutes more. Gotcha. Um, how many mocks did you take, number one? And, and what was your reason to take mocks and what information did you extract from them? I took four mocks. The first was before starting anything. That's the one that we talked about, 650. Mm-hmm. Then the second one was two months later, I'd, after I'd given substantial time to EG Matt. Um, and here, I really just wanted to focus on verbal. I just wanted to make sure. That was a 740 score. That was my 740 score. And the breakdown was 42, 49. 42, 49, 41, 49. One of the two. Um, yeah, one of those two would, would get one of the, 740. Um, and then I, that's my focus was uh, verbal on the second mock, but because I'd already started doing those word problem questions, mm. the quants seemed fairly easy. Got the it. third, the third mock was an anomaly because, and and this is very specific to me. It's it's a very test taking strategy um, thing. I, I end up with a six ninety because not slept well, I'd not eaten. Um, I was not in the headspace and I decided to get up and on the day I said, all right, let's take a mock because it's a Saturday. So just to, I want to get more specific on that one. It's very, very Mm -hmm. important because it has happened with five people, five students, each one of them actually has been in, ended up with the same score that you have. So this third mock, what was the score split? It was a 38-47. 38-47. So both sections suffered. And 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 you were a, a, a V47, so you got a 38. So that was the, the extent of 
that that's how much your verbal score can deteriorate if if it's if you if you're not fresh if you're not you haven't slept enough it throws and, you, and it throws you off it throws you off 100% and i think the worst part about that is you go from a 740 to a 690 hmm. so then you start doubting whether uh, that 740 was a fluke okay and then and what happens were you, were you doubting yourself i wasn't I, I mean, I knew this was an anomaly because I, I know myself well enough. But in my head, I was like, well, 740 is a really good score. So what is my true score? So I need to take another mock test. And I need okay. to, I need to, you know, take it the way I would take a, an official test. So the last official test I took, I got a 720. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I was fairly confident that, that my range was going to be between 720 and 740. Got it. Um, and reading comprehension reading comprehensions are tricky because I think I was doing verbal very well. So the last question happened to be a reading comprehension. And in my opinion, it was one of the harder reading comprehensions I've read. I remember it to this day. That was uh, in the fourth mock is what you're saying. Fourth mock. Got it. Um, so my split was 48 quant and then um, 41. So 720, right? Yeah, 48, 40, and 48, 41 would, would get you a 720, yes. Exactly, exactly. So I said, all right. I And and between the two, of, I mean, not between the two of us, it's like now. Uh, I was uh, I was very comfortable with the 720, 730, 740. Okay. I, that, was, that was more than enough for somebody uh, like me because my, my background is sort of not your traditional background. So I said, all right, I'm very happy with that. And then on test day, I mean, it's, it's oh, so happy. Oh, yeah, this is 760. Now, we also, you took the online GMAT? I took the online GMAT, yes. Okay, yes. and before we end, I think this is really important. So you mm. also, the reason you, you don't have a 780, but a 760 is because you had internet issues on the online GMAT. I lost about five to six minutes on my quad, yeah. Okay, uh, and, and, and that's why you got a Q48. It's conjecture at this point, but I'd like to think so. Yes. Oh, five minutes would do that. I would. Yes, say. because I think the next, I think the next three questions, I, I glossed over for about ten seconds each, and I just answered. So it was, it, yes, I, I wasn't comfortable doing that, uh, but I had to finish the test. And okay. I would say the one thing that sorry, Rajat, you were saying. Were you when you connected when you did did the online GMAT? Were you hardwired to the internet or were you using Wi-Fi? I was using Wi-Fi. Don't ever do that. I, I so, see. I didn't know that. I mean, I was using the Wi-Fi, and I think the reason why it went down is because my entire building has one Wi-Fi. So, like, it's one of those things where uh, when they do an arm testing or something, your Wi-Fi is shut down for like two minutes or so, and and for some reason they were doing an arm testing that day. So, not only did my internet go off, I was also hearing these blaring alarm sounds. So it wasn't fun. It wasn't. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, it's just I don't recommend anyone using Wi. I'm a just from a background, I'm a wireless guy. I I made my first radio when I was 12 years old. Oh wow, okay. So I was using those old vacuum tubes and all. And and as someone who 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 I feel wireless is in my blood, right. and um, and I don't trust the generation of Wi-Fi that existed before the current generation, and which 95% of them, uh, Wi-Fi six is probably the only Wi-Fi I trust. Right. Um, more specifically, because if you're taking the online GMAT during those three hours and six minutes, you're yeah. transmitting close to, to 20 gigabits of data. Oh. oh. And, 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 and that's a lot of data to, 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 to ensure that you have a consistent Wi-Fi connection. And that has to be real time. It's not that you can download all of that data no. in 20 minutes or so. No. It has to be real time. It has to go up um, yeah. from your computer, not from the, the reliable servers that we have, but from yeah. your computer to the server. So, so wow. it's, it's not a, Wi-Fi yeah. is not a great option for that. I, I wish I knew this before. I did not know that. And if not, I'm very thrilled with the 760. I'm not going to lie. But in the moment, it definitely, it, it throws you off. And it does. And in the, in my EG man interview, and I'll say this in 30 seconds because I know oh, it, we're kind of done. Um, in my EG man interview, I was saying this, um, 
in my verbal section, I already thought I'd messed up, to be very honest with you, because, um, and again, this is, I, I partly blame Scholar Anium for this. I was, <laughs> I was getting questions that I thought were very simple. So I started assessing myself in the middle of the test, which do not do that. Don't do that. Don't, if you don't do that. I mean, I was getting sentence correction questions, which were obviously hard. Um, but because I'd done so many hard cementing quizzes, and because I was obsessed um, almost with getting that 80, 90% on hard, these seemed fairly. So what I'm saying is trust the process. Trust, uh, trust the process, absolutely. Trust and and one thing that I will also tell you is, I think you've got to also understand the GMAT. So mm -hmm. GMAT is um, is what I call as is, is an exam that estimates your ability. Mm -hmm. And if you do really well early on, mm -hmm. it's the test, the way the test functions is it says, okay, I understand this guy is good. There's mm -hmm. no point wasting hard questions on him. So we have seen people who get to a V47, V48, V49. If you look at their ESRs, okay, and, and, and what you're going to find is if you do block one and block two of questions really well, right. the difficulty level goes down in block three because well, the GMAT says, I happened. already know what I need to know. So that, I think that's what happened. I think that's what happened because my reading comprehension was a humanities based article. I, it was, I think it was on politics. Mm -hmm. Then my CR and RC were also fairly straightforward. So, I mean, I got worried because I, I didn't know this information. Um, I thought it just keeps getting harder and harder and harder. It's very similar to if you're interviewing someone and, and the person in the first 30 right. minutes makes such a good impression. Mm -hmm. you, if you have an hour of time, you're not going to worry about harder questions. It's like, okay, there's nothing more that I can ask us that, that would help me evaluate this guy. Right. But you don't want to give that person the job offer too soon because you'd ask for a lot more money than... 100%. I, 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 didn't ne I never, um, on all my four mocks, and I, mm -hmm. and I do suggest mm -hmm. that people take an alternative approach to this, Mm -hmm. um, I never did integrate reasoning or AWA. Hmm. Um, and you got a six on AWA. I got a six on my AWA, um, which I thought was out of eight, but turns out it's out of six. I, it, yeah. it is out of six. IR is about of, uh, out of eight, so that's IR is about out of eight. I think I got a five on eight in, in IR. I would definitely suggest people to 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 take the entire mock test for sure. Um, you don't want to be thrown off. I think it's just, I think it's really important to understand what you're validating at every stage. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't take every mock test with everything. There's, I mean, if you're primarily validating your quant and verbal, there's no point taking AW and IR uh, to put you off. But when you are two weeks before the test, that's kind of mm -hmm. when you should. Uh, a lot of people ask us this question, how long do I need to study for IR? I say, if once you go through our CR course, probably two days, no more than that. If you're done with quant and verbal, it's two days right. to go through our IR course. And AWA should be about, you know, five essays. So depending on how rigorous you are, it's between four to seven hours of effort. I did, uh, I, I did EG Maths IR course as well. I mean, I think you have those statistics. I, yes. I did EG Maths IR course as well, because I think um, a couple of questions were throwing me off. So I wanted to see uh, EG Maths approach to it, to it. And I mean, uh, as you would guess, EG Maths, uh, you know, they, they understand the kind of IR questions that come. So I saw a whole list of the type of IR questions. I said, all right, this is exactly what I need. Mm -hmm. um, so I did study for the IR as well, a little bit, I think a day or two, I did, definitely. Did. Yeah, I think this one to two days is plenty. You've got to be familiar with the question types. 100%. Okay, so let's kind of go through questions over there. Sure. Um, so I think um, Nisha's question, I'm going to take that first. Uh, Julie, if we can put that question. The question is, how are questions in the verbal later on during the test and how did you manage time on those questions? So I think first of all, you know, how were you, you kind of talked about how those questions were, but did you struggle with timing? I did not struggle with timing. And I think it goes uh, largely to what we were speaking about earlier. I used to read a lot and I read a lot consciously so that I would not struggle with timing. Um, and reading a lot and being able to comprehend a lot of information, that's what my aim was just reading a lot does not really help. So when I started reading those economist articles, and mind you, I do come from a reading background. So when I did start reading those economist articles on a daily basis, I would say I was giving about six minutes an article or seven minutes an article. Um, by the time I took the GMAT, I think I was at four and a half or five. So so I want to put this in context over here. First of all, these are economist articles. Economist articles are unlike New York Times or some of the other articles, which are really, really long. They are about, 
an economist article is between you know 1200 to 2000 words or so exactly. um, a gmat rc passage is about 450 words or so uh, 450 is kind of the longer passages mm -hmm. there. and when you right. look at um, so if you go to uh, for example um, uh, for some of the, the the journals that you physics.org or uh, yeah, you, discover you magazine go, for example yeah yeah you can you can also go to the journal of um, free thinking economic liberties so on and so yes. forth yeah. yeah so when you go there those essays are a lot longer so i mean when you put that time in context you have to take the length of the article in there now having said that a gmat rc passage is, is i think more dense with regards to the quality of information that it has than an economist article so so you will still take two and a half to three minutes to read it even though yeah. you can probably i was taking i was taking notes i was taking more than that and I was very comfortable taking more more time than that, and uh, and I spoke about this with DJ as well. The first the first question on my RC would often be between three fifty and four minutes, and then the um, second one. And the second one would be thirty seconds. The other one would be twenty five seconds, thirty seconds, and that's because I gave the reading comprehension a lot of time. I gave it more time than you know one is. So we had a few students who challenged themselves in RC. They said, I am not going to, I'm going to read the RC just once. I'm, my quality has to be so good that I will not look at the, the passage again. And, and that's how they would practice. And, and, and that very habit of practice helped them get through RCs phenomenally fast. They so would I still would... take those because the, the quality was, initial quality was so high. They would take three and a half, four minutes, but then they would get done with the passage in a total of six minutes. Yeah, so that I I I would say that yes, I, I was pretty much like that to the point that I would make notes as well on my on my whiteboard. I would I would make key notes. That's another very important point. That mental break when you make notes. A lot of people think, hey, making notes takes time. No, it doesn't. Once you start yeah. getting into the habit, it's just about scribbling a couple of let, uh, words at the most. Hundred percent, and and I would take my time on that. Um, it can get. Uh, it can get a little bit nerve wracking uh, because there is a lot of information that you're going through. And, and the problem is when you see you spend four minutes on one question, it can throw you off. But again, um, you trust, the process. You trust the process. You're not spending four minutes on one question. You're spending four minutes on it's a lot investment. Of it's the same as spending 150 grand on your MBA. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Don't 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 say that to me right now, Rajat. Just, just not, not right yeah, now. It's, it's, it's invest. Uh, you're talking about it's like I regret not going to 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 booth uh, mm -hmm. and, and and a booth's your your um, yeah. I shouldn't say that. All right. So I think a great follow up question that Aditya has is that for verbal, how do you strategically interpret and understand the question rather than basing them off your intuition? That's a very good question. I think the first thing you need to do. Is keep your intuition out. Great question, I would say. It's phenomenal because I think the latter part of this question is what struggle is what gave me a lot of problem um, in um, in verbal, specifically in sentence correction. So the first thing is keeping your intuition out of the GMAT to as large an extent as possible, and it's easier said than done. Strategically interpreting and understanding the question, uh, I can't speak to other courses because I haven't taken any. But that's what the EGMAT does for you. It breaks down subjectivity. It treats it like a science to the point that sentence correction and CR and RC, but in my case, specifically sentence correction, is all about strategically breaking down what the sentence means, how the context flows from that sentence, and then does the grammar make sense. Once all of those three things fit, then your intuition is out of the picture. And the problem is, if you don't keep your intuition at bay, there are certain concepts that are so hardwired that they might go against um, the process. Like there has been a lot of times, um, and there's, I have another analogy for you, just me two seconds. There's been a lot of times where, you know, EG man's told me something and my intuition's told me something else. And I've taken my intuition, I've learned the hard way. Um, and it's much like building an Ikea table. You're given a manual, right? Sometimes you think that the screws don't fit because you're going about it wrong, but you're like, no, no, no. This, this screw must fit here because it makes sense. Just, just follow. Go, go by the manual. 
just go by I, the manual. I've learned it the hard way too. Yes. Yes. So, so you have to keep your intuition out of uh, at bay. But for you to be able to do that effectively, you need to understand the objectivity behind sentence correction because there is some. That's such a guy example, though. I would say that <laughs> the, the IKEA example. I I remember when I used to build that, but seven eight years back, and and um, as guys are not used to reading manuals. Just, I mean, you might call it call me stereotyping, but but I've seen enough statistical evidence to back this up. Sure. And and it's like Pyle would come and see me struggling at some point. It's like you, this is where you were ten minutes back. Why are you, uh, why are you? He's like because this doesn't fit. And she would just open the manual. Like, oh, this is not supposed to go here. This other screw is supposed to go here. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. So, so so but but that's that's a great point that that I would say. So so I think um, one of the other things is those very. Um, uh, 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 explanations that you struggle with, you said my intuition says something else, we struggle with them internally a lot. I mean, if you were to really see some of those explanations that you see, they, they are mm -hmm. a result of about 30 to 40 minutes of internal debating and shouting at each other. So Pyle, Shraddha, mm -hmm. I and Stacy, four of us would shout, sometimes Harsha yeah. would come in and it's like, no, if you say this is the explanation, there are five other examples. Explain to me how does this structure fit in these contexts? And this is that what the author is going to say? And, and so it is a lot of effort to come up with something for, that's simplified and beautiful. For SC and CR specifically, I watched yes. all those videos. Because for me, it wasn't as much that I was getting it right, but that I was getting it right with the right reasons. With the right reasons, yes. Um, so I needed to make sure that, you know, when I was getting a CR question right, Mm -hmm. um, that it was for the right reasons. And I would go through the explanations on semantic quizzes because uh, because those were harder ones. And in SE, I went through a, a pretty much, I would say, 90% of the explanations. Okay. So uh, let's kind of take Hi Himadri's question. Himadri, oh. I'm sure he's... Um, I'm pronouncing his. Oh, I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He says he got a 760 Q51 excellent V41 really good score again, oh, wow. but um, he messed up his IR, uh, AWA with a three. Should he retake to improve um, the AWA? Um, I think I'm a bit more qualified to answer. You that should question. answer that question. Yeah. Yes. So, so um, there are two things. First of all, you know, look, contact these schools um, uh, 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 that you're applying to and, and ask them this question. Some schools are very particular about it. Others are not. Uh, the second thing is a lot would depend on why do you have a three? I mean, if you had issues with regards to your internet, if the keyboard froze, um, you should express that in an optional essay. Um, better still, if you can get an exception from, from the GMAC or, or an acknowledgement from the GMAC saying that, hey, these extenuating circumstances existed and that's why his, your AWA got a, um, uh, uh, there was an impact on, on the quality of your submission. Um, having said that, you know, the, the B schools will look at that score. They would look at, you know, how well can you express yourself? Um, and, and, and so ex expect greater scrutiny in, 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 the, in that pace. So in your interviews, um, of course, you're going to do your essays, right? But your interviews, if you have a video essay, expect greater scrutiny over there because of, of that AWS code. They want to make sure that that, um, that that you can make good, solid arguments mm -hmm. when you're expressing yourself. Because taking the GMATs about tell, checking off what's right and what's not, but AWS is where you're putting forth your arguments. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so make sure you, you, you A, use the optional, let's say B, contact B schools, and C, prepare really well for, for, for the interviews. It's like the yep. score was great. I mean, I, yes. I honestly don't know how you can get better than that. But... Yep. Yes. Um, so, was your strategy um, okay? I think. Uh, do you want me to take this one? What other prep guides would you No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do anything other than EGMAT and OG. Uh, no question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, other than EGMAT and OG, just reading on the uh, on the Economist, mm -hmm. and then, uh, and I think GMAT clubs question bank. Uh, but again, specific to OG, I wasn't spending my time on hard question banks which weren't OG anyway because I mean I I didn't want to I was already getting hard enough questions at EG man so. yes yes you were um I think as Adik's question is really good is the question at the end what was your strategy different for the first few questions in verbal than for uh, for the two ones towards the end I mean did you treat them any differently 
No, but I treated my structure very differently. Uh, the the structure of taking the test was uh, was very clear in my head, and I've always suggested this to a lot of people: start on your strong foot and then end on a weaker one. So the I don't know whether I've never taken the GMAT before, so I don't know whether the GMAT allows you to play around with your structure, but the online GMAT does. Uh, in my yeah, case, the GMAT also does. Well, it does. Yeah, it does. Your yeah, section order is there. Perfect. So I started with verbal, then quant. Um, and then IRAWA, I think, is fixed. And the reason why I started with that was because I knew um, I wanted to warm up and and hit my uh, you know hit my strong points first, so that I was in a good state of mind to take on something that I wasn't naturally as good as as verbal. Um, so I wanted to start strong and then get into want and also by the time you get to by the time you've already done one part you're sort of exhausted and i don't know about other people but the more exhausted i am the lower my ability to read and comprehend a lot of information is so uh, so yes. you verbal was first and then quant and then verbal was definitely first and then quant but within verbal and quant did i treat them did i treat questions no, the first few questions in verbal did you treat treat them any differently no you shouldn't and the answer so uh, this is a great question, and, and how many people just from a just from a yay or a nay? If you just want to type a letter, and, and say yes, this is interesting for us. So we have a strategy webinar this Saturday, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, you know we call this you know how do you build your strategy plan to score seven sixty? How do you track your metrics? Which metrics you track or so? And and one of the, the the many misconceptions that I address in this with with data and stats is this question: Should you treat the first ten any differently? And, and and why should you not treat them any differently and how should you prepare so that you do well in the first 10 so um, register for that um, so so definitely that's it now I want to ask another question for people who are listening how many of you are planning to take the online GMAT uh, versus the in center so if you can just put that data in I think it's valuable data for us um, um, so how many of you are planning to take the you know the online GMAT which is GMAT at home? Uh, versus going to a test center, if you can have that. Um, also, we have some. Uh, we have a geometry webinar. This that's this weekend, and um, and and I know you didn't study geometry, but but that's a. Uh, I wish. Uh, and you said you you uh, will have to. Yeah, you 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 you're not as strong in geometry, um, but but this is a webinar that Pyle um, hosts, and, and and I can tell you, there's no better instructor than Pyle, and. Um, and, and so, so if you're struggling with data sufficiency questions in geometry, we start with strong, hard data sufficiency questions. We build a foundation, and then towards the end, we attempt those data sufficiency questions again. And, and we've seen incredible differences in in performance um, for people who actually you know falter early on and then um, do really well later on. So, far. okay, so that's the link to the geometry webinar. Other than that, Pratik, um, you know, thank you very much for uh, for joining us over here. Um, I enjoyed speaking with you. I'm sure um, you know, uh, folks um, on, on YouTube. They, they learned a lot from, um, from from your journey, and I want to. I wish you. I want to wish you good luck for um, the the upcoming interviews. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. And you know, uh, when I started my GMAT journey, um, I saw a lot of these videos, um, and so so it's it's a great full circle to be back here speaking with you. And before this, I spoke with Hananjay. Um, you know, if somebody can take even some, even one bit out of this that helps them, then I would have done my job well enough. But it was such a pleasure to get to know you and speak to you. And, and thank you again for, you know, all of that information that you put through EGMAT. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for being a diligent student. And, and for those of you who want to see more such success stories, you're going to be hitting about the 200 mark very soon. Uh, I think within within the next within the month of October, we'll be hitting 200 success stories uh, on, on, on our platform um, or on, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so so definitely subscribe to that. It's the world's largest connection of such interviews. And um, and yeah, so uh, uh, good luck, Pratik, and then have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rajan.